Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. Now, as we've said before, I'm in the midst of driving. That's right, I drive. I don't just travel, I drive. Because I don't get to be defined by subordinates. Now, I don't operate a motor vehicle any longer. I used to operate motor vehicles. I used to have a CDL. I used to have a Class A license, a Class C license, a Class D license. I've had a Class D license. Chauffeur's license, you know, motorcycle license, and all of that stuff. I've done it all. But guess what? I don't need to do all of it no more. Right now, I just go from point A to point B. I mind my own business. And I've been telling that to officers for years. Uh, where were you headed? To mind my own business? What about you? You know, that, literally, that's what I tell them when they, where were you headed? To mind my own business. How about you? You see, that's what I do. I mind my own business. I don't mind commercial business. I don't mind your mama's business. I don't mind your father's business. I mind my business. So I'm going to go do that. That's why I started the MYOB Society, the Mind My Own Business Society. Okay? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am actively seeking new members of the organization. All you need to do is apply. All right, let's talk, because we have to talk. Yesterday, I was reviewing a case. I was looking at the New Hampshire. New Hampshire tried to introduce a law, and the law that New Hampshire tried to introduce was the law dealing with licenses and whether or not a party had to have a license when traveling. And we were talking about the bill 1778 from the New Hampshire Senate and House that they tried to pass but didn't pass. Now, hold on. It doesn't matter if it passed or didn't pass. There is a case in there. Judge Grimes of the Supreme Court for New Hampshire in, and y'all have to excuse all the messages, there will be a lot of messages coming, but Judge Grimes of the Supreme Court in New Hampshire to 1966 decided about, pay attention, household goods, consumer goods, not-for-profit or gain, and the taxation of these household goods, consumer goods. Now, please understand, household goods, consumer goods that are required as a consumer transaction are not taxable. Do y'all understand what I just said? Because it may not make any sense to y'all. They are not taxable. Why can't you tax household goods, consumer goods? Well, there is a good reason for that, ladies and gentlemen as to why they cannot tax household goods and consumer goods. You have a right to your necessities. It's called the necessities of life. That's why in bankruptcy, your necessary essentials cannot be seized from you in bankruptcy. That's why everybody who's losing their home in bankruptcy, they're losing their home because they're not documenting their home as being a necessary essential. They're not putting in a declaration of homestead. Look, if you own a property right now and you're not fixing foreclosure or you are fixing foreclosure, you're going to have to do a declaration of homestead. Those of you who are in the Fourth Amendment program, you will receive it. You will be receiving, or if you have already received it, your declaration of homestead plus some other documents. There will be an update sent to you shortly. Um, as of this date, today is the seventh of November. Okay, as of this date. As a matter of fact, if I do recall, I have a sister who was born on this day. So, uh, right now, she and I. No, my sister wasn't born. It was uh, February 7th. Sorry. Uh, next month, she and I will be the same age for about a month. And then that will change in February. About two months. Then that will change in February. Well, anyway, back to the hotel. Uh, my son's birthday. Well, I don't do birthdays. You guys know this. But the 
day he was born, I should say, was the 11th of this month. So he will be 32 years old, the young man. All right, let's get back to the hotel so that you guys can understand what's going on. Go down to the county recorder's office and record your homestead. Follow their procedures, their rules. Do not sit up here and listen to videos on how to do something. You cannot walk into somebody else's house and tell them how to run the house. So follow their procedures, follow their rules, because that's the rule, ladies and gentlemen. It's their game, so play their game. Don't play yours. You cannot get into somebody else's court, somebody else's football field, and think you're going to do what you want to do, how you want to do, when you want to do, why you want to do it. Don't do that. Now, you saw there may have been a hesitation in my voice because there was a tractor trailer coming in front of me and there was a turn and he was coming my way and I was coming opposite his direction and the turn said 15 miles an hour. Of course, he took the turn at greater than 15 miles an hour. The hesitation was I had to make sure he didn't come over my lane, you know, because then he would have needed a resurrection. Okay, um, back to the conversation, y'all. The hotel, as it were. Uh, if you don't remember the hotel, back to the hotel, then you'll never understand why I keep saying it. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Ladies and gentlemen, by going to the county recorder's office and following your homestead, if anybody tries to foreclose on your home, say if your home is collateral for a loan, you document your home as your primary residence. No one can foreclose on your primary residence. No court can allow your primary residence to be seized from you. They claim, well, only if you have equity in the home. No, the Constitution doesn't say anything about equity. The Constitution doesn't say anything about equity, people. Equity is not the issue. It isn't as long as you have equity, it is they cannot foreclose on your necessary essentials because they are necessaries. That's the point. Sometime, someday in the future, you guys are going to get this. But for right now, that's the best I can do for you here. Now, back to the Grimes case, the Supreme Court of New Hampshire. It was about a Dodge Dart. It was Jones versus something bank. Uh, the bank starts with an S. I don't know the name, but it's a bank that was or still is in New Hampshire. But it was Jones versus that bank. And this Mr. Jones person bought a Dodge Dart. That's right, a Dodge Dart. And when he bought the Dodge Dart, there were some issues as to charging him fees and taxes and other things. And Mr. Jones said, y'all ain't doing that to me. And the Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Jones, said that the property, his automobile, was a consumer good. Your home is a consumer good. And that the consumer good is exempt from taxation. I just went back to look up the case, and you know what? <laughs> that section is gone. Imagine that. I haven't done any more research on it because it's not that big of a deal. Because you can find this under Uniform Commercial Code, Article 9, Section 102, and Article 9, Section 109. Now, in a moment, I'm going to have to pick up my phone like I'm doing now. Now, I am traveling at a high rate of speed. Sorry, there is a lot of stupidity out here. I had a car that was almost blocking the lane. I am traveling at a high rate of speed. What I'm trying to do at this high rate of speed that I'm traveling at, I just needed to make sure we were still recording. I'm not traveling at a high rate of speed. I'm doing 57 miles an hour. I actually slowed down from 65. The speed limit is 65 miles an hour here. Um, back to the conversation about Grimes and saying that the vehicle was not taxable. Ladies and gentlemen, what you need to understand is your home is necessary essentials. Your home is tax exempt. All of you need to call the county assessor's office and let them know, excuse me, this is my primary 
place of dwelling. This is my primary place of habitation. Uh, I'm told that you guys are not supposed to be charging me taxes on my primary residence. This is a household product, a consumer product. I don't use my house for commercial business. Show me the law that says that you get to tax me on my home when it is used for household purposes, consumer purposes, not for profit or gain. Then while Alex Trebek plays his theme music, they'll come back with some argument and you'll say it was you. That's not what I asked you for. I said show me the law that gives you authority to do this. Because you can only operate under authority of law, not authority of ordinance, but authority of law. They won't be able to. So he said that to me, and you cannot find the exemption form for your state. By the way, I was speaking with a young lady yesterday and a consult, and we were able to find the exemption section of the tax code for her home that listed this exact information from the state of Texas. It's every state. It's not just the state of Texas. So those of you out there who are paying taxes on your primary residence, if you've got two homes or something like that, you can only do it for the primary. Now, if you're paying taxes on the primary residence, then you are a lot. And you need to speak up. If you don't speak up, then that's your problem. That's what you do. And then you can get those funds back. Let them know. I ain't never told y'all I was using this for commercial purposes. You never got anything. That was a presumption of your part. You're not allowed to go by presumptions when it comes to my property. I am the authority when it comes to my property. By you putting forth a presumption concerning my property, you have just denied me the right to property. That's how you handle that stupidity, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Just a suggestion. Some of you are going to take the suggestion. Some of you are going to understand the suggestion. Some of you are going to get the suggestion. But just a suggestion. Now, for those of you who can also have bills and having the prospect of having to explain to a police officer that you are not required to have a driver's license, your arguments are not founded correctly. You're arguing the wrong point. Telling somebody that you got the right to travel is not the issue. Whether or not you have the right to travel is not the point. Nobody is arguing that you do or don't have the right to travel. Okay? That's a moot point, as they would say. So, what's going to be had, what's going to be said concerning all of you, is your argument is going to be the following. Oh, I am not saying that the state does not have the authority or the right to protect public safety. No, what I am saying is I need you to provide evidence or proof that I am a threat to the surrounding population, my fellow civilians. And once you provide proof that I have been deemed a threat, well, then you can require me to have a license because that's the only time governments get jurisdiction is when they can document a valid reason. And you've not articulated a valid reason. Just that simple. Literally, just that simple. Sorry, I brought my speed down to 60 and there was a guy at 157. So I had to let him ride. So you guys need to understand, the argument from the courts is that the state has a justifiable reason for protecting public safety and ensuring the safety of the public. Yes, they do. But now you have to prove that I have been deemed a threat to the safety of the public and that my driving on the highway is a threat. No, no, no don't come at me when it's a possible threat. Don't come at me when it's a perceived threat. No, no, no. Where I have been found guilty and that I have been deemed and classified a threat to the public whereby I need to be licensed. See, the government cannot force you into contract. 
Every license is a contract. Every license is an agreement. That's why you got to do things under penalty of perjury. That's why you got to swear that you're going to abide by this law and that law. That's how they get jurisdiction. Now, the government cannot force you into servitude, even if they claim it's for public safety reasons, unless you've been convicted. The 13th Amendment comes from the Northwest Ordinance, and it is quite clear. No one may be subjected to involuntary servitude unless, pay attention, they have been duly convicted in a court of law. That's it. I just said it in a nutshell. Because I'm a nut and I love shells. Okay? So, the argument that you are required to have a license because the government has the authority to require you to have a license. No, the government has authority to require you to have a license if they have already deemed you or have you have been convicted as being a threat to society when it comes to driving. Not a threat to society in general, but a threat to society when it comes to driving. If they have not found you as a threat to society, then the first thing you say to the police officer when he pulls you over, excuse me, officer, is, I'm sorry, are you conducting an investigation at this time? Okay, what is the presumption you're operating under? They'll look at you kind of stupid. No, I'm sorry, you presumed. So what is the presumption that you're operating under? See, just like you can't operate a motor vehicle without a license, police officers are not supposed to be operating on presumptions. There's nothing in the law that permits a police officer or the courts to operate under presumption. The courts will say, well, no, because a person is presumed innocent, that they, it doesn't say that nowhere in the Constitution. It says nobody shall be held to answer for a crime or infamous offense unless a bond. Okay, so they claim that since a person is held, they're presumed innocent until they're proven guilty when you're still holding them, idiot. Go back and look at the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for any crime. So why are you holding them? They, they have not been convicted. And that's why all bail is excessive, ladies and gentlemen, in the United States. All they did was took and created uh, statutes to circumvent the Constitution. We're not going to talk about that right now. We're not going to go for the full hour either. Like I said, I'm just doing this because I definitely needed to talk to some of you about the wording that the courts are using because the wording that the court is using is very, very, very essential for you to pay attention to that wording. The courts are not saying that the states can require you to have a driver's license under every circumstance. The court is saying the, courts, the states can require you to have a driver's license for the protection of public safety. Well, they can if I have been accused of a crime. If it has been duly conviction, noted that I am a threat to society. If you don't have that, then no, the state does not have jurisdiction. That's your argument. You're not required to have a license. There is no one who can say that you're required to have a license if you're going from grandma's house to grandpa's house. Okay? Uh -uh. You're going from the stove back to grandma's house. Nobody can require you to have a license. No one. That's not just the United States, ladies and gentlemen. That is international law. Under international law, everyone has the right to travel. You guys really need to understand this. This whole papers thing, that all started when it came to issues of slavery. Now, not just slavery of Afro so-called Kansas Americans. No, not, not just slavery of them, but slavery of other indigenous people and or nations when they were conquered by other nations and or kingdoms. For instance, when Rome conquered a nation or a kingdom, their people, now hold on now, they weren't initially required to have papers. But if there was a necessity to prove something, you best believe they needed a letter or some type of paper showing that they had the authority to do something. In the Medo-Persian Empire, the exact same thing. In the uh, Grecian Empire, the exact same thing. That's why you have kings and their signet rings. 
okay? So there's always been this, you must have papers thing, but you're not required to have papers. The Supreme Court says, in our society, everyone needs to identify themselves. There is no such thing as you need to have photo identification. A photo does not identify you people. Y'all need to pay attention. A photo doesn't identify you. Your name and birthday doesn't identify you. You saying what your name is identifies you. My name is, hi, my name is who? My name is what? My name is, okay? That's who identifies you. No one else can identify you. A piece of paper can't identify you. And people have gotten so taken away from reality by this this so-called bureaucratic system that we exist in, thinking that they need to show papers. So, as I told you, I don't use a driver's license. I haven't used a driver's license since 2008. I allowed it purposely to expire. I didn't return it to no one. I let it expire. Why? Well, first, <laughs> that particular license, when I let it expire, the expiration cancels that contract. It operates as a voiding of the contract. By me letting it expire, that was me saying, I do not wish to contract with y'all no more. And I ain't going to. Okay? I've been doing traveling and traveling and traveling. And at that time, that was 2008. The amount of traveling I used to do around this country, driving from California to New York to Florida and all that, uh, no problem with just showing them an ID. Because what did the Supreme Court say in several cases? The only thing you need to have present and present to an officer is identification. They didn't say a driver's license. The officer, when he pulls you over, when he says, license and registration, please. Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there's no law. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there is. There is a law requiring you to give him your license of registration upon demand. If you don't believe me, go look at 31 USC 40. For commercial vehicles, when you are pulled over for inspection, and remember the police officer is inspecting your vehicle. Okay? Now, what some of you guys need to do is when a police officer is approaching your vehicle, they touch your license plate. The reason why they touch your license plate, and this is for an officer, and just in case you were to kill the officer and take off in the vehicle, they touch the license, and not the license plate, I said license plate. They touch the uh, tail light or the back of the bumper, but they literally, usually it's the tail light. And the reason why they touch the tail light is so that they leave their fingerprint on the tail light. So that just in case you take off and they find your vehicle, they can now associate that it becomes evidence against you. Ladies and gentlemen, a police officer is not permitted to touch your vehicle unless you have a contract with the state. See, that's their nexus. The nexus is the driver's license. That gives them the authority to pull you over, inspect your vehicle, touch your vehicle, impound your vehicle. So stop arguing with them. Your vehicle is registered with the state. Then they have the authority to pull you over. Your vehicle has a license plate from the state. They have the authority to pull you over unless you commandeer the license plate. And unless you provide proof that you paid for that license plate, that is your property. You don't need to explain to him what this means. No, here is my receipt. I paid for these plates. These are mine. This is my property. This doesn't belong to no DMV or motor vehicle department. This belongs to me. Now, unless you got evidence to the contrary, and don't sit up here and talk about no stupid law, because the law does not take care of possession. I have a receipt showing I paid. That means that commerce says this belongs to me. And there ain't no court that's going to say otherwise, because you can't bring a case in court regarding this. You ain't going to say that to the officer, but that's what y'all need to understand. He can't go to court to try to prove it otherwise, because he's not a party to the contract. 
Police officers are not a party to the contract with the DMV. Police officers are a completely different department. They are not the DMV. Okay? They cannot intervene on behalf of the DMV. No matter about any subcontract, your agreement is with the Department of Motor Vehicles or Motor Vehicle Department, Transportation Department. Your contract is not with the police department. Remember, the Supreme Court has said the police owe you no duty. They owe you no duty. They see you in trouble. They don't have to come help. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a lie. Because if you look at your law in your state, if you see someone in trouble, you must render aid. You cannot just watch somebody just get beat up. Everybody has that law in their state. Now, they ignore it in every state. But every state, if you see somebody in trouble, you must come to your fellow man's aid. It is that thing about we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our war. Blah, 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 blah. That was in the declaration. Okay. Ta-da. So, back to the hotel. When the police approach, again, the first question out of your mouth is, excuse me, officer, are you conducting an investigation? And am I the subject of your investigation? You need to know this. Why? Because anything you say will be used against you. Now, he's supposed to give you that warning at this moment that you're being investigated. And if he asks you any questions, I'm sorry. I cannot answer your questions, sir. You will answer my question. No, I'm sorry. You just told me I'm under investigation. So by law, I'm under no obligation to answer your questions. You are operating on a presumption. And unless you have evidence, actual evidence, sorry, you are SOL. You're SOL? What does that mean? something offered last night. Okay? That's what it means. Huh? That don't make no sense. I'm, I'm something offered last night? That don't make no sense. Exactly. Alright. If the officer gets upset or angry, your immediate thing is, I'm sorry, you appear to be in distress. I'm going to need you to contact your supervisor. Immediately. Matter of fact, is this conversation being recorded? You don't have my permission to record. You're out in public, and because you're in public, I can record. Excuse me, I am not out in public. I am in my private conveyance, as defined in statute. You are not permitted to record me in my private conveyance. I am not doing public transportation. This is private transportation, as is clearly evident. So, no, you don't have my permission to record me audibly or uh, visually. You are the one who operates in public, so you can be recorded, but there is no law permitting you to record me. Now, if I am operating and I'm out in, quote unquote, follow the rules, if I'm out in public, then you can do that, but you cannot do that here. Literally just that simple. Literally just that simple. Look, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm telling you right now, nobody's ever argued this with them. Like I said, my job is to build presumptions. We've been put under a presumption because some judge said it. Some judge said it. And most people don't realize when the judge said it, he was operating on a technicality. Okay? It was a technicality. Yeah, police officers can film in public. The same reason a police officer can film in public is the same reason why you get to film them when they're out in public. But if you're in your private automobile, you're not out in public. Hold on now, there is a caveat. I told you it's a technicality. If the car is registered with the DMV and you have a driver's license, then they can record you because you signed a contract waiving your right. Pay attention. You signed a contract waiving your right. Go ahead. The waiver of one right is the waiver of them all. You guys don't really understand it. Just like the saying, the denial of one right is the denial of them all. These are maxims of law. And if you didn't understand it, if you didn't know, well, now you know. So, many of you, stop arguing with the police. Stop debating with the police. That's not your concern. 
let them argue with themselves. Your job is to let them know, not candidly, just are you conducting an investigation is your first question. Stop handing them papers. That's your property. Stop just handing it to them. Now you're going to eventually hand it to them, but you have to establish, pay attention, your defense. You see, you just asked the officer, were you under investigation? If he says that you are, now you can do everything under the rest. Are you demanding I give that to you? Okay, so that means that you're commanding me to violate my right against self-incrimination. Okay, no, here you go. And he'll look at you like you're crazy when you give him everything. Well, I'm writing you a ticket. You can't write me a ticket now, but go ahead, you can try. I'm writing you a ticket, and you're going to do this ticket, and you're going to show up in court. Yes, and I'll get it kicked out, because I just told you. I just told you that that's self-incriminating information. You said I was under investigation, and I wasn't willing to give it to you, but you commanded me to give it to you. And so because you commanded me to give it to you, that's the rest. And that means that everything from that point is a moot point, mother. Seriously. That is how the cookie crumbles, ladies and gentlemen. Once you announce to the officer, hey, excuse me, are you conducting an investigation? And if he confirms that he's conducting an investigation, that means it's an official investigation. If you're under official investigation, you are under no duty and or obligation to participate in that investigation. I'm sorry, I'm not willing to participate in your investigation. And then if he starts asking you for your property, I'm sorry, I can't give that to you because I'm told that anything I say or do can be used against me. That's only if you're under arrest. Are you sure? I'm told that it's even when I'm under investigation. But if you're saying it's only when I'm under arrest, well, I guess you're right because you know more about the law than I do. Ta-da. And that's how the cookies crumble, ladies and gentlemen. Because everything at that point that he does to solicit information from you is tainted. He can't do it. Once you say, are you sure? I'm not willing to do it, but if you command me to do it, if you give me an order to do it, then I will do it, sir. Because I don't want no problems. And you just do it at that point. And then when you go to court and say, oh, I'm sorry, the officer, that information, I'm going to ask that all of that information be ruled as inadmissible. You can't use any of that. You can't even use the ticket because that was procured through duress. Yes, the officer told me I was under investigation. I told him I didn't want to participate in this investigation. And he gave me a direct order to testify against myself. Other than that, he wouldn't even have my name. Because he told me I was under investigation before he asked me any questions. And because he told me I was under investigation, I have the right to remain silent. But he violated that right after I told him that I wasn't willing to participate. He told me I had no choice. Well, that's a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. No one may be compelled to be a witness against themselves. And you guys are using the information I gave the officer after I told him I was unwilling to participate? You're using it against me. So that means you compelled it. And because he compelled me to respond, that means that you violated the law. And that means that he violated a right that is secure, not a constitutional right, but a right that is secured by the Constitution. And there are certain protections in place to prevent that from happening to people like me. Now, are you going to sit up here and uphold the Constitution? Because I must remind you that you and that officer were under oath. He violated the Constitution. Are you going to follow his lead? And now if you get both of them for violating the Constitution, you can file a claim against both their bonds. Remember, a judge or a peace officer who gets a claim against their bond, and they, they will have a difficult time getting rid of the bond, and they can't be a public servant without having a bond. Pay attention. Pay attention. They must be bonded. Even if you don't find a bond for them, risk management department for the state, for the county, for the city, is the one who carries the bond. Pay attention. This is so that you guys don't have to argue, get upset. Look, fine, he gave you a ticket. 
even if they take you to jail, ladies and gentlemen, you ask them, am I under investigation? They ask you for anything after that. Papers, identification, your name, anything. You simply say, I'm not willing to participate in your investigation. It doesn't matter what they say after that. You, the next thing you say, excuse me, are you giving me an order to do it? Because if you're giving me an order, I will comply. And then you do whatever they say at that point. Because they just compelled you to be a witness against yourself. Ta-da! Now let any attorney out there who calls themselves a criminal law attorney tell me I'm wrong. I dare them. Sorry, there was a person who did a video about Title 18, Section 30 about motor vehicles and the definition and they, the attorney said to the people who were using 18 U.S.C. 30 to prove that their motor vehicle was not properly defined under law because that definition says that a motor vehicle is something that is in, uh, used for commercial purposes. Well, he says, well, that didn't apply because if you read the statute, it says as used in this chapter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me educate you. I reached out to this individual attorney who I have respect for, a lot of respect. And I told him, you were incorrect. As used in this chapter doesn't necessarily exclude or include everything that's discussed in that chapter nor does it prevent it from applying to other chapters. And I gave him several examples where the Supreme Court has held this principle that that definition applies broadly. And I don't think he's going to respond back to me, um, but it's okay. Look, ladies and gentlemen, the problem I have with some attorneys is the fact that they see I'm not one of those bar-carrying mugbers or I'm not an admission <laughs> to practice law that they don't have to give any credence to anything I say but I've not had pay attention I want you guys to understand something I've not had a single attorney come to me and prove me wrong now I've had and I want you all to understand this I've had some times where I misunderstood a particular statute and I've had a judge prove me wrong. That's only because I misunderstood the statute and I literally did misunderstand the actual statute because I wasn't where I am now in statutory interpretation. My better understanding of the statute comes from a guy, Thomas Clark Nelson. Do your research on Thomas Clark Nelson. Thomas Clark Nelson was, in my opinion, brilliant. I'm not going to take away Thomas's credit. Thomas Clark Nelson was brilliant, in my opinion. He was a researcher. Now, I don't agree with everything Thomas said, okay? I really don't, because some of it I can prove to the contrary with law. But, and that's because he did the research prior to my finding what I found. In other words, prior to it being revealed later. So his information was 100% accurate at the time he first wrote it. But there's been new developments, new information that has come out that has said, oh no, well this applies and that applies. And so that's why this works and that works. Does that work? I hope so. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now that you see a little bit more of how the law works, a little bit more about mortgages and driver's licenses and traveling and homestead and taxes, hopefully you will, again, stop arguing. You don't have to try to prove to people that you're right. You can go both 